Good evening again. I'm Michael Creighton, also a member of the World Affairs Series Planning Committee. We'd like to remind you to stay after the talk for a reception and book signing in the back and to continue the discussion. Both of the books that she, that she has written are going to be available over there by the door for sale. Now, it is my honor to introduce Phyllis Bennis, a fellow at both the Transnational Institute, a global fellowship of scholar activists, and the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington, D.C., where she directs the New Internationalism Project. She specializes in U.S. foreign policy issues, particularly involving the United Nations and the Middle East. Phyllis Bennis worked as a journalist at the United Nations for 10 years and currently serves as a special advisor to several top-level U.N. officials on the Middle East and U.N. democratization issues. She's the author of Understanding the Palestinian-Israeli Conflict, a primer, co-author of Ending the U.S. War in Afghanistan, a primer, has published numerous articles on Palestine, Iraq, the UN, and U.S. foreign policy, and is a frequent contributor to U.S. and global media. Please join me in welcoming Phyllis Bennis. Who's waiting for me? Everywhere I go, I have to adjust the mic down a little bit. There. Good evening. Good evening. It's very good. I'm delighted to be back in Iowa. It's been a couple of years since I was here, and I was thrilled when I had the invitation to come again. I want to thank the World Affairs Series, the students in particular, as well as their staff, uh, for putting together this evening. And I'm glad that we're framing this around transitions, because what a transitional time this is. This is an amazing time that we're in. You know, the, the title that I saw for, for my talk was something like the Arab Spring, how can we help? And I thought, well, the easy answer for that is right downtown at Occupy Des Moines, Occupy Iowa. I think that what we're looking at is a shaking up of how politics is being done all around the world. And it's happening in Des Moines and other places of, in Iowa, it's happening in New York, it's happening at Wall Street, it's happening in Washington, D.C., and it's happening in cities across this country and in many places around the world where people are starting to say, there's something wrong. This isn't just about we want to vote for the other guy. This is about we need a different system. We need structural change. We need massive transformation. So when we talk about transitions, this being a moment of of global transitions. You know, I was struck the other day, some of you, I'm looking around, I'm trying to judge ages here, but I think those of you who are students may not remember, you probably actually, some of you weren't born yet, oh, it kills me to say that, but uh, you will have read in the history books, and some of you who are not students will remember the first Palestinian uprising that began in the late 1980s, a nonviolent, society-wide uprising of protest against occupation. Quite an extraordinary thing that went on for several years. And it was called the Intifada. That was the word the Palestinians had chosen. And they chose the word uprising as the nearest English equivalent. But when you talk with Arabic speakers, what they tell you is Intifada doesn't really mean uprising. It really refers to shaking up or shaking out. It's a, a different concept. And they thought that was a bit too complex, so they gave it the easier term, uprising, which everybody sort of knows what that means. But I've been thinking lately that as we look at these extraordinary mobilizations that have become known collectively as the Arab Spring, the Occupy Everything movement that we're seeing in our own country, the shakeups in Europe, the shakeups all around the world, that this notion of shaking up and shaking out, changing, challenging, is actually a much better way of understanding some of this change. So maybe what we're looking at now is sort of a global intifada, a global shaking off of old patterns and a, and a shaking out of old ideas and the effort to embrace and create new approaches. So I think this is an, just an amazing, an amazing moment when we think about what can we do to help the Arab Spring. I think the first thing that comes to my mind is we can create an American autumn to bring about the changes here that people in Egypt and in Tunisia and in th countries throughout the region are trying to achieve for, for, their own, for their own countries. 
We have to demand of our government a new kind of respect in our foreign policy. Our foreign policy, as most of you know, has not been characterized by a lot of respect for other people and other countries and the legitimacy of international law. International law never got no respect in this country, except it turns out that people in this country actually sort of care about international law. That despite all the claims of, you know, right-wing pundits and plenty of people in Congress who say, oh, the American people don't want the United States in the United Nations. We want to get out of the United Nations. International law doesn't apply here. We're the Americans. Our law is the only thing that applies. It turns out that not everybody in this country feels that way. And indeed, the question of international law emerges as something that a lot of people take quite seriously. One famous example back in the 1980s when there was a, a, a big upsurge in anti-UN sentiment and there were a lot of claims being made that nobody supports the United Nations, the U.S. should get out of the U.N. altogether, the U.S. should kick out the U.N. headquarters. There was a study done by the, one of the universities, the University of Maryland and their, their uh, public policy research center. They did a, a survey, a poll, on public opinion towards the U.N. And it turned out, didn't surprise some of us, surprised a lot of people, that the United Nations actually was far more popular and had much greater credibility levels than almost any instrument of the U.S. government. More than the President, more than Congress, more than the Supreme Court, more than almost anything except the post office. God knows why the post office was doing so well, but at that moment somebody had gotten a letter on time and they liked the post office. So then what they did, they identified the ten members, so that was sort of interesting, right? But then they went further. They identified the ten congressional districts that were known for the most hardline anti-UN attacks. Those members of Congress who were the ones that were out there beating up the, you know, the UN every chance they get. And they did a much more intensive polling of those areas because they thought, well, this will tell us why is it that these members of Congress are so rabid, they're so antagonistic to the UN. And then the really surprising thing happened because it turned out that the people in those districts were identical to the, the national figures in their support for the United Nations. They weren't opposed to the United Nations. There were little groups in each of those districts that would sit in their little attic churning out letter after letter condemning the UN and making it appear that this was a big deal, that, the, that everybody hated the UN. And the lesson there, it seems to me, was twofold. One is, don't believe everything you read. Don't assume that because some member of Congress is sort of antagonistic to the UN and whatever, that that means they actually represent public opinion in their district. But there's something else, I think, that it, it goes to the, to the credit of those small groups that were out there churning out their letters and their faxes, you know, to say, we're all against the United Nations. The famous saying, history is made by those who show up, applies more and more. And the access that we all have to Facebook and Twitter and email and all the easy ways of communicating hasn't changed that one bit. And I'll give you the example. We're talking about the Arab Spring. I was in Cairo in, in uh, June, which was after the, the 18 extraordinary days of Tahrir Square, but still a, a moment of enormous excitement and about the, the overthrow of a, of a terrible dictatorship that had been backed and armed and paid by the United States for so long, for so many years. And people were still just thrilled at what they had accomplished. And I was struck while I was there that one group of people that I hadn't heard much about while, and, until I went, while I was here, that were so proud of the role they had played were the taxi drivers and the minibus drivers. And I thought, well, what's this about? So I started talking in, you know, little bits and pieces of Arabic and a lot better broken English on their side. Why? What did you do? You know, what, what, what's your deal? Why are you so proud? And it turned out that the reference was to the period which was most of the 18 days of the Tahrir Square uprising. The government had shut down the internet, had turned it off, essentially, had shut down the cell phone networks. For those weeks, most of those weeks, there was no access to cell phones, to the internet, to email, to Facebook, 
to Twitter. There was at the beginning, and it played a huge role in the mobilizations. But then it was shut off, and the mobilizations didn't stop because the organizing continued. And the reason that the taxi drivers were so proud of themselves was because they had played this very key role. In Cairo, poor people travel primarily, because Cairo's a huge city. It's, it's you know, really, really spread out, and it goes for miles. And if you want to get across town, poor people mostly travel, because the buses aren't very good and there aren't very many of them, in minibuses. And the minibus drivers and the taxi drivers became the conduits for information. So somebody would get on a minibus and he would tell the driver, we're going to meet today at such and such a time at this corner and we're going to march to Tahrir Square on this route, spread the word. And they'd get off and get onto another minibus. And five more passengers would get onto the minibus and the driver would tell them, okay, here's the plan for this neighborhood. We're going to meet at this corner. We're going to march on this route. And they continued the organizing. So all of those old-fashioned organizing methods of talking to people, passing out leaflets hand to hand, using the mosque as a gathering place and as a bully pulpit to let people know what the plans were. All of these came back into centrality when the much more modern electronic versions of how people communicate were shut off. So history is made by those who show up even when they don't have access to their Facebook account. And that becomes, I think, a very important message for us as well. We're hearing now about Occupy Iowa. I just came from Washington, D.C., where we have two Occupy D.C. encampments that are going on. We're hearing now some dangerous news. The first of the U.S. versions of this, Occupy Wall Street, in New York City, just word came out a few hours ago that the mayor of New York City, Mr. Bloomberg, is about to send the police in tomorrow morning to shut down Occupy Wall Street. And in fact, I'm going to ask all of you to take down a number, to call, to say, if you agree, that you support freedom of speech and the right to assemble and the right not to have police roust a peaceful assembly of people in their streets trying to pose an alternative way of looking at the world. It's an easy number to remember. 212 is the area code for New York, and the phone number is 212 New York. You have to go through a long waiting thing. It's, you know, it's the mayor's office and whatever. Do that. Do that tonight. Send messages to your friends, Twitter and Facebook, that there's a danger that Occupy Wall Street may be attacked by the police tomorrow morning and forced to leave their encampment. That would be a huge defeat for our movement in this country that's trying to look at different ways of thinking about the world. Because I think ultimately, this is what we can learn from the Arab Spring. That there's more than one way to look at a region, at a country, at a policy. That we have to be always thinking and looking ahead and looking to a future that could be very different than what we've had in the past. You know, some of you will remember during those incredible days of the Tahrir Square uprising, there was, there was a great deal of attention paid to two things that linked it to us here at home. That was happening around the same time as the uprising in Wisconsin, where the public employee unions that were under attack from the governor came together to say, no, you can't do this. As public employees, we have the support of the people here. If you're going to attack teachers, you're attacking our children. The teachers' work conditions are the living conditions of our children. And the mobilization, you all know the stories, how they came to the state capitol and occupied it. Occupy Madison became this new rallying cry. And one of the things that happened was that local restaurants were sending food to the, to the protesters who were staying 24-7 at the Capitol. And one was a, a local pizza parlor that had become very famous. And they had put out the call for people all across the country who wanted to support this mobilization in, in, uh, uh, in Madison, saying, call us with your credit card number and we'll send as many pizzas as you can pay for to the protesters. And people across the country started calling. And on one day, they started getting dozens and dozens and dozens of calls from Cairo, international calls with credit cards 
saying, we want to support the people of your spring. We want to buy pizzas for your protesters. And then there was the famous picture. How many of you saw the picture? You know what I'm going to say. Only a few. OK, well, there was a very famous picture across the US, went out on all the wires, of an Egyptian man standing in the midst of Tahrir Square with a sign that said, in English, Cairo stands with Wisconsin. It was huge. It was huge. They recognized it. They recognized it. We, just last night in Washington, my institute was presenting our annual Human Rights Awards, which we give every year in the name of our two colleagues who were assassinated by the Chilean dictatorship in, by a car bomb in Washington in 1976. And each year we honor one domestic and one international person or group doing important human rights work. And the domestic award this year went to the progressive movement of Wisconsin. And the three people who came to accept it from the unions, from the mass organizing, one was a former, uh, well, not former, he still is a teaching assistant at the university because it was the teaching assistants union that sparked the Madison uprising. And it turns out that he's an Egyptian American who had also gone to Tahrir Square. So we had the linkage in our hall as we, as we moved to present the award. We had that link between Tahrir Square and Madison, Wisconsin, living proof. It was, it was, an, amazing, it was an amazing moment. But the Arab Spring is a very complex reality. It's no longer simply two countries with a great nonviolent uprising against tyrants. It's no longer just the defeat of US-backed dictators. It's become, as all things do, far more complicated. It still is about people standing up to US-backed dictators. But in some cases, they have now taken up arms, like in Libya. And they have then called for the direct engagement of the United States and NATO. This has made, in my view, everything worse in Libya. The numbers of casualties got higher, not lower. The notion that it was going to protect civilians didn't protect civilians who were being attacked by the anti-Gaddafi forces. It's made everything much more complicated. And it's lost some of the credibility in the region where other actors in other Arab Springs are looking at Libya and saying, it's a little tricky. We're not so sure where they stand because it's no longer independent. That was the great point of pride in Egypt and in Tunisia, the pride of being independent, not being backed by a foreign power. In Libya, yes, a dictator has been overturned, and that's a huge victory. It's not quite complete, but it's almost there. But at what cost? And how independent will the new government be in Libya when it has had to depend on the US and NATO acting as its air force for these many months. So it still remains a challenge to long-standing US policy, a policy that goes back generations in this country, where you know, if you look at the history of US Middle East policy, not even going way, way back, but if you go back, say, to 1967, the time of the, uh, the, what led to the Israeli occupation of the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem, that was the middle of the Cold War. And up until that time, Israel had been a close ally of the United States, but it didn't have what we now call the special relationship that it has enjoyed since 1967. And the reason that that transition happened had everything to do with the 67 war, and it had everything to do with the Pentagon, which looked at the outcome of that war, where what appeared to be a much smaller military had trounced according to the mythology, six Arab armies. It wasn't quite true, three of them really never fought, but whatever, that was the mythology of the day. And certainly the Israeli army had fought brilliantly and triumphed over all of the Arab opponents. The Pentagon looked at that and said, wow, we could do business with these people. Business being the operative word that became the centerpiece of that relationship. This is the Cold War. The US is stretched all around the world, waging proxy wars and supporting proxy enemies and, and supporters in a proxy battle with the Soviet Union. And Israel quickly became a cat's paw for those US interests all around the world, not only in the region, 
but as far afield as, as Nicaragua and El Salvador, Chile, South Africa, uh, Guatemala, Mozambique, countries around the world where proxy wars were underway, Israeli military trainers, Israeli arms, became a crucial tool of U.S. foreign policy that was taken up in waging the Cold War. The Arab Spring has challenged the regional impact of that policy because beyond Israel, that policy led to a three-part policy that included Israel and oil and stability. Those were the three goals of U.S. policy in the Middle East region. So in the Arab countries, that meant supporting, arming, financing, providing political backing to a host of dictatorships whose sole job relative to the United States was to keep their population sufficiently suppressed that they wouldn't interfere with either the production of oil and the shipment of oil to the U.S. and the West under U.S. control, because it's ultimately, you know, when we talk about oil, we should be clear, this isn't about access to oil. Everybody has access to oil. The oil market is, is a, a global market. Anybody who wants to pay the price can get the oil. The issue is control. Who gets to decide on the kind of contracts that are signed? Who gets to determine where the pipelines are built? Those are the critical questions when we look at how oil plays a role. So when we look at that regional development, what we saw was a host of Arab regimes, incredibly repressive. Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, the UAE, Egypt, Tunisia, the litany of Arab countries characterized more than anything else by US-backed dictators. Some of them absolute monarchies, not even the illusion or the, the delusion of democratic representation of any sort. Others that were military dictatorships operating in the name of democracy, Egypt, countries like that. But in no case were the peoples of those countries able to be actors in their own countries, able to be agents of their own national fate. And it was the US support that made that possible. It led to the Camp David Agreement between Israel and Egypt. It led later to the agreement between Israel and Jordan. And it didn't matter to the US in orchestrating those agreements that the people of Egypt were being incredibly repressed by this military dictatorship under Sadat and then under Mubarak. It didn't matter that the king of Jordan, everybody's favorite monarch, who was very clever, much smarter and more, more strategic than many of the others, was still an absolute monarch who allowed some of the trappings of democracy earlier than some of the others. You know, you probably heard a few weeks ago there was this great big announcement about how this, the king of Saudi Arabia announced that women were going to be able to vote. And it was like, wow, what a big deal. And then it was sort of, well, it's not that great because it's not going to be this election anyway. It's not going to be till 2015. Well, that's a problem. But the bigger problem is, what are they going to be able to vote in? What the men get to vote in now is this little advisory council that has absolutely no power and can be dissolved by the king at the drop of a hat and has been on several occasions. So really, that's what we're talking about being such a big deal? That women get to also participate in a completely fake version of democracy? It's not my idea of women's liberation. We don't have to talk about the driving thing. That's a different issue. But you know, I mean, this, none of this mattered to US policymakers. As long as there was enough stability to keep the oil flowing, keep the arms purchases underway, and keep the relationship with Israel at an even keel. That has characterized the region all this time. In the meantime, you have two regional powers. You know, there were always three requirements to be a regional power broker in the Middle East. You needed size of land and population. You needed oil for wealth. And you needed water because the region is half desert. So if you're going to be a power, you need people and land and money and water. And there were always only two countries in the region that had all three, Iran and Iraq. And that was a big part of the reason that they had such sharp competition over land, over resources, over oil pipelines, over all those things. That was, it was far more competition over those things than it was religious uh, divides of any sort.
It was because those were the only two countries that had the indigenous capacity. You had other powers, certainly. Israel was a huge regional power, but its power was derivative because of its relationship with the United States. It didn't have either size or water. Other countries were powerful in certain ways, but only Iran and Iraq had those two. Jump ahead now with the destruction of Iraq by the U.S. war and a dozen years of crippling sanctions, we suddenly have two powers again, because in, throughout those years, another country that nobody had really paid much attention to because it was big and it had a lot of water, but it didn't have any oil, so nobody paid attention because how could it have any money, has suddenly become the 17th wealthiest country in the world, 17th biggest economy. That was Turkey. And it was like, all of a sudden, wait a minute, how did that happen? In a decade, Turkey has tripled its per capita GDP. Unequal division of that wealth is still a problem, but it has gone down. The inequality has gone down every year for the last 10 years. How did that happen? Nobody was watching. They just kind of did it and suddenly emerged. We now have, again, two regional powers, Iran still, and the other is Turkey. But there's a big difference. Turkey and Iran compete with each other. They compete for markets. They compete for regional influence. They compete politically. But they're not going to war against each other the way Iran and Iraq were every other week. It's a very different relationship. Turkey is a much different kettle of fish for the U.S. to deal with. Turkey is a member of NATO. Turkey is an, a, an aspiring member of the European Union. Turkey is a huge ally of the United States. And the Turkish government has made quite clear that it is not a country to, or a government to be taken lightly or to be taken for granted. So the U.S. has suddenly had to face a very new understanding of what its relationships can and must be with regional powers in the Middle East. In a very similar way, the Arab Spring in each country has transformed that relationship. It has transformed the relationship between people and their governments, and it is transforming the relationship between those governments as they change and the United States. Not because necessarily all the governments are, are in power, uh, that are in power now are any different than the ones who were in power last winter, but they don't have the same options now that people throughout the Arab world have claimed their rights as citizens. They've taken up the banner of citizenship as the call for this new era, young people in particular, to say, yeah, it's not enough that we have some access to some basic education. This isn't about absolute destitution. These are not the poorest countries, except for Yemen, which is indeed the poorest country in the Arab world. Most of the countries that have risen up are not the poorest countries in Africa, or in Asia, but we have, among others, the youngest countries. We have people that are growing up getting an education, doing it all right, doing what they're supposed to do, and finding there's no jobs, finding they don't have a chance of getting a job because the economy has been so distorted by the massive arms deals that their rulers made with the United States, bloated military budgets, bloated levels of corruption, and no jobs for young people, even for university or, or, or even high school graduates. What sparked the Arab Spring in Tunisia? The story of a young man who had gone to school, had done everything right. He wasn't the poorest of the poor. He, had a, he was selling fruit. He couldn't get a job, so he was selling fruit on the street. And almost every day, the police would come and they'd roust him and make him leave to go somewhere else. And then finally, one day, he got rousted again by two police who stole some fruit. And then he was told by a, a police woman, which to him was even more humiliating, that he couldn't stand there. He had to just leave. And the humiliation, because he couldn't provide for his family, he knew he could no longer live that way. And you know the rest. He set himself ablaze and killed himself in the most horrific way someone can kill themselves. But with a flame that set a spark across the world, something that he never anticipated. He wasn't doing it to spark a revolution. 
he was acting out of utter, utter personal despair. But the impact of that in a society where people were feeling helpless, feeling they had no way to act, all of a sudden was making something possible. And it was Tunisia, of all places. I mean, who'd have thunk? Tunisia, I don't know, I've been in Tunisia a couple of times, and I gotta say, if I had to pick any country in the Middle East that was gonna be the first to have a revolution, Tunisia probably wouldn't have even crossed my mind. I always forget about Tunisia. Not, I'm not proud of that, but I'm, it is a reality. It's a small country, it's not that strategic in US thinking. But suddenly, suddenly, this move in Tunisia transformed the scenario of the region. And then when it was taken up in Egypt, which is, of course, one of the most important countries of the region, the centerpiece of Arab culture for millennia, 4,000 years of history. And I gotta say, for any of you who are thinking about going to Egypt, now is the time because they desperately need tourism money. Tourism has been on the skids. And there's nobody there. I mean, it's incredible. When, the day I went out to the pyramids, there were probably 200 people in the entire plain of Giza, which used to have, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of people there at any moment, and you could barely move for tourists. So now is the moment. Just a bit of advice. But I think that we forget sometimes the history that people are responding to. You know, Tunisia was not the poorest country in the Arab world, and it wasn't even the biggest gap between wealth and poverty. It had a good-sized gap. But it was a country where expectations could not be met. And at a certain point, that just becomes too much. So if we look at the other, the other countries where this has now taken off, Yemen, Yemen is an incredibly complicated country. There's issues of tribal loyalties. Yemen is an ancient country. It's not a modern country. It's not modern now, it's, it hasn't been modernized, and it's not a new country. But the loyalties of Yemenis is a very complicated set of features, who people see. Yemen traditionally, in certain ways, is like Afghanistan. It's not as poor as Afghanistan. But like Afghanistan, all politics is local in a far more profound way than anything that we mean by that saying. Most people identify with and have loyalty to their family, their clan, their village, perhaps their regional area. That's about it. What happens in the capital doesn't have much impact. So the notion of a national mobilization against a dictatorship that had tried to impose national control was shocking and amazing to see. That suddenly there was a national identity that people were claiming and that the identity was that of challenging the dictator and saying we will have a Yemeni identity. That it isn't only people from Sana'a, from the capital, that have that identity, but that all of us rural people who live in villages of tiny numbers, who live out in the desert, who don't see people from another village for months, even years on end, that we can be part of this too and claim it as our own. We don't know what's gonna happen in Yemen. You know what happened, the, the dictator was the subject of a, there was also fighting within the military and among some of the, the tribal militias have fought each other, it's become quite violent. Arms are everywhere in Yemen. So perhaps that wasn't so surprising, but it's been devastating in its impact. The dictator was attacked and almost killed, but he, was, he went off to Saudi Arabia. His, he was healed, sort of. And now he's back home, still claiming every other day, I'm going to give up power and we're going to have a democratic process. Oh no, actually, I didn't mean that. I'm really not going to do that. He's now said that, I think it's up to seven times so far, that he has promised that he would accept this, this uh, process and, and then says, no, 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 I, I can't do it yet. So we don't know. We don't know what's going to happen in Yemen. Yemen remains the poorest country in the Arab world. That has everything to do with how people identify in that country when they are faced with that level of poverty. Bahrain. Bahrain, one of the little petro-states that's hardly big enough to be a state at all. 
I mean, talk about the UAE, the same thing. These are not states, these are petrostates. They only exist because they're a tiny, tiny group of people sitting on a huge pool of oil. It's one of the huge contradictions of the Middle East that the biggest pieces of, the biggest pools of oil are where there are the fewest people, where people are concentrated in large numbers. In Egypt, with a huge population, 60, 65 million people, almost no oil. Syria, 25, 28 million people, bits and pieces of Israel. Uh, of, of, sorry, I'm looking at my notes saying Israel. Bits and pieces of oil. This is, the oil is concentrated where there are hardly any people. So what happens, these little petrostates get created and they import people. They import people. So in the UAE, for instance, the majority of the population are not Emiratis. They're not people who have citizenship. They are not citizens. They are, quote, guest workers, mainly from some of the most impoverished countries in the world. They're brought in from the Philippines, from Bangladesh, from Pakistan. They have no rights. Their passport is taken. They are assigned to work somewhere. They have no rights. They are subject to the worst kind of labor abuse. The women who are brought in as housekeepers and nannies are routinely raped by their employers, and they have no recourse. The number of people who are citizens is tiny. The whole populations are tiny, but the percentage of citizens is even tinier. So we have not yet seen in the UAE a rising, but we saw it in Bahrain. Bahrain that has always prided itself on being more modern than Saudi Arabia. It's, on, it's joined to Saudi Arabia by a causeway. It's a little tiny island. And it has lots of Westerners who come to teach at the universities and engineers and they're building all kinds of fancy buildings and whatever. Very good education. But when people began to demand a say in their lives, they weren't initially calling for the overthrow of the monarchy. They were just asking that there be some investment in people's rights, that the monarchy not be able to determine everything. But because this, the politics and the religion, like in so many parts of the Middle East, is mixed up because Bahrain happens to have a majority Shia population, about 80%, and yet the ruling family is completely Sunni, and the privileged class, they're all pretty privileged relative to these other workers that are brought in, but within the Bahraini society, the privileged class are overwhelmingly Sunni. It took on a sectarian tone. But the big secret that we didn't get to hear very much about is that at the end of the day, the reason that Saudi Arabia sent troops to help the Bahraini government suppress so brutally this uprising, with almost 40 people killed in three days, hundreds injured, thousands arrested, you may have heard about the, the sentencing just a, a few days ago of 15 doctors and nurses who were working at the main hospital treating the wounded. And they were convicted of aiding a revolutionary process or undermining the government or something like that and sentenced to 15 years in prison for healing people who were brought in at, the, at death's door. In Bahrain, the part we didn't hear about was the Fifth Fleet. The Fifth Fleet is ours, U.S. The U.S. Fifth Fleet, one of our nine carrier groups, the Fifth Fleet is based in Bahrain. This little tiny island with very few people is great at providing a home for the U.S. Fifth Fleet of warships to patrol and attack throughout the region. That's very important to the United States. So the United States spoke to our great ally, Saudi Arabia, and told them, of course, if you go in, we will have nothing to say. So there were a few quiet, we, we urge, we urge the Bahraini king to uh, negotiate with, the, with the, uh, the reform movement. We urge that there be a dialogue, period, full stop. How did that compare to Libya? Did we hear calls for dialogue? Actually, quite the contrary. When the head of the African Union, South African President Zuma, flew to Tripoli to try and engage in some kind of diplomacy. He wasn't even allowed to enter the country by these outside forces that were now guarding the skies of Libya. So the question of how the U.S. has dealt with these different springs of the Arab Spring 
has far less to do with the nature of the government, they're all terribly repressive, less to do with the nature of the uprising, they're all mixed up in a, a mishmash of all kinds of interests, some sectarian, some secular, some democratic, some Islamist, some all over the place. They're all similar in that way. But what matters is the relationship of that government to the United States. So you can be damn sure that if we hear any murmurings of an uprising in Saudi Arabia, that will be suppressed right quick, probably before we even get to hear about it. And we will certainly not hear from the United States that, indeed, it's kind of a problem to have an absolute monarchy controlling every bit of life of its population, from whether and when women can drive to how people have to be dressed. You know, we hear a lot about that, for example, from the State Department about Iran which has an equally, in my view, but, but I don't live there, it's not my culture, not my country, so I can have an opinion, but I don't get to tell them. I happen to think it's pretty backward for any government to be telling women how they should dress. We hear our State Department talk a lot about that vis-a-vis -vis Iran. We don't hear a whole lot about Saudi Arabia. Every once in a while we hear a little bit, Hillary Clinton was kind of guilt-tripped into admitting that, oh yeah, I kind of wish that women in, in Saudi Arabia could drive. Well, you know what? The poor women in Saudi Arabia aren't so concerned about driving because they can't afford a car. You know, the issue is we don't want to have to waste our money on our foreign chauffeurs. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, it's really hard for me to get too excited about that one. The problem is there is no democracy. There is no citizenship. There is only subjects and the king, right? But that seems to be fine for the United States because at the end of the day, they guarantee our control of oil. And they guarantee that in Bahrain, I don't know where the reform movement would have stood on the question of the Fifth Fleet. Would they have demanded that the Fifth Fleet pack up and sail home? I would hope so. I certainly wouldn't want some foreign navy occupying my country. Imagine. But that's just me. We didn't hear what they would have thought because they weren't allowed to say anything. They were suppressed before they ever got that far oppressed in the most brutal ways. So we have a host of periods, we're, we're, we're six, eight, nine months into the Arab Spring. We don't know what the next steps are going to be. We do know it's not gonna be our call. The question of whether the United States was going to recognize a new government, the reform government in Egypt, you all remember the timing of all that. It was criminal, it was outrageous that it took so long, it was so grudging. And the day after Mubarak resigned, you had the special envoy of the president announcing in, in Germany when he flew, when he flew back from, from Cairo en route home, he said, oh yes, well I do think that, the, that President Mubarak should stay there to maintain stability. It was, what? What the hell were you doing there? And then you had people in the Obama administration falling all over themselves saying, that wasn't our message. Oh, really? He was your special envoy, for God's sakes. What is, you know, it's, this was insane. They were so flat-footed. They were caught so unaware that this was going to happen. And yeah, they were going to have to respond. But you know the really great part? It really didn't matter very much at the end of the day what the U.S. said. Mubarak was overthrown by the people of Egypt, not by the withdrawal of support by the United States. And to the degree that we see the success of overthrowing dictators throughout the region, we're going to see it in that context. We're seeing it popping up all over the place now. This last summer in Israel, it was the Israeli definition, the Israeli version of the Arab Spring. You probably heard about it. There were protests on a daily basis, a tent encampment reminiscent of Tahrir Square lined up on Rothschild Boulevard in downtown Tel Aviv, one of the wealthiest streets of the country. Now at the beginning, the focus was on the cost of housing. It was a, it was a financial, economic issue. People were angry because it, it started actually about the cost of cottage cheese. Cottage cheese, how many of you have ever been to Israel? Not too many, okay. Cottage cheese is a very big deal in Israel. I don't know why, but they eat tons of it. And the price of cottage cheese had gone through the roof. So people were like, kind of riled up about the, the cottage cheese wars. And then, housing prices have been getting higher and harder. Nobody was talking about the settlements. 
Nobody was even talking about the fact that the reason that the settlements are expanding so fast is because the government is putting money into them. You get money when you go to live in a settlement. It's called subsidies. The government subsidizes the settlements for all that they can claim, well, this is natural growth. We are, you know, we have to allow this. The government subsidizes the illegal settlements across the West Bank and Arab East Jerusalem, where there are now 600,000 illegal settlers. 600,000 people who violate international law every morning simply by waking up. Because their bedroom is built in a house on stolen land. That's a lot of people. And the reason there's so many, because the vast majority of them are not extremists. They're not nationalist crazies. They're not religious extremists. Some of them are, but the majority are not. The majority are settler yuppies. They move there because it's cheaper. You can get a beautiful house with a lawn, you know, these white houses on the hill with the, the red tile roofs and swimming pools and all those things subsidized by the government for maybe 500 bucks a month where it'll cost you $3,000 a month to get a crowded, steamy one bedroom in, in downtown Tel Aviv. Who wouldn't want to live there? One of the biggest settlements in the West Bank, Ma'aleo Dumim, it's a city, it's 40,000 people. They have two colleges, high schools, swimming pools, an industrial zone, you name it, they've got it. The slogan or the, the logo of the city is the Picasso Dove of Peace. And you talk to people there and, and it's a left-wing community. They all vote either labor or, or merits, the left-wing parties in Israel. And, and they'll talk about, God, the settlers are such a problem. And you, you sort of look and a little confused and, well, but you live in a settlement. And then they look very confused and they say, this isn't a settlement, this is a city. And it's like, well, when did it stop being a settlement? When it became a city. So it's like if you can violate the law big enough, suddenly it becomes legal. It, it's, a, it's a bizarre way of thinking, but it is how, I mean, I was just there a few, couple of years ago and had that exact conversation. I was just dumbfounded by it. But to come back to this protest in Israel, so there's a big protest about the cost of housing, not talking about the government subsidies to housing in the West Bank and why that might be a little bit better to subsidize poor people inside Israel. We didn't hear that. But we did hear an, a, a huge attack on the government. And what was amazing was that it very quickly became an attack on Netanyahu's government, but not in the usual way where it was just about you know, the political parties, the Israeli, Israeli political parties and the political system is, is pretty wild and, and pretty wide open, so almost anything goes. But this was something brand new. The chant that became the iconic symbol of that protest was saying, Mubarak, Assad, Bibi Netanyahu. Mubarak, Assad, Bibi Netanyahu linking the elected Israeli leader with these Arab dictators. That was huge. That was huge. I was stunned when I saw the footage of people chanting that. And yet it reflected the structural issue facing Israelis around economic rights. Now the challenge, of course, is when is that going to be linked to the question of the cost to Israel of this illegal occupation? which brings us back to the United States. What are we going to do about what the US is doing with our economy, which is all tied up with, on the one hand, not enough taxes for millionaires and billionaires, no taxes for corporations, bailing out the banks, no money for jobs, while we're spending trillions on useless wars in the region and while we're spending $30 billion over these 10 years in military aid to Israel, $30 billion, all military aid to the 23rd wealthiest country in the world. It's crazy. Those of you who live in Iowa, just this year, you spent $1.3 billion for the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan that did not make any of us any safer. That amount of money could have provided health care for 734,736 children across Iowa. It could have provided hiring of 23,000 elementary school teachers or 28,000 firefighters. You tell me what keeps our communities 
safer. Just here in Ames, Ames spent $18.5 million this year on the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. It could have paid for 2,600 children to be given a slot in a Head Start program. It could have paid for 17,500 homes to be converted to sustainable wind energy. Or it could have paid for 2,700 university scholarships. What keeps the people of Ames safer? This comes back to the Arab Spring. And it comes back to how we come to understand the role that our government plays in the rest of the world. Because at the end of the day, when people in the Arab Spring or anywhere else, when people are rising up against dictatorship, what they want from us is not just, you know, come and, and stand with us. I mean, that's symbolically exciting and great, but that's not really the point. What we need to do is stop our government from denying them those freedoms. You know, after September 11 of 2001, after those horrific crimes, those horrific attacks on us, we kept hearing the question, why do they hate us? Well, they hate us because they hate our freedoms. Well, I'm sorry, I beg to differ. They, whoever they is being referred to, don't hate our freedoms. They hate our policies that deny them their freedoms. That's what makes people around the world hate our policies and sometimes hate us. I'll tell you, I've traveled in the Middle East for years. And I've traveled alone, a woman traveling alone. I never worried. I never felt at risk. I mean, there were a few times in the first Intifada when Israeli soldiers were shooting and that sort of thing. But then you know where you are. You know what, what's risky and what's not. But just traveling, I never felt at risk. But I'll tell you, these days, I still do it, but I watch my back in a whole different way because people are angry. And our military, which is all over the region, is very well protected, very well protected. Ordinary people can't do anything about those military people or even the politicians. But if they're angry enough, they turn on the symbols of the United States, of American citizens, who are not so well protected, who are ordinary people like us walking around never used to be like that. This notion that these wars have made us safer is the opposite of the truth. They have put us at far greater risk. So I want to just say, because I want to finish in a minute so we have time for questions and, and discussion, I think the best thing we can do for the Arab Spring, to help the Arab Spring, is to bring a spring to our government, the American autumn. Because despite the Arab Spring, our government's policy in the region has not qualitatively changed yet. They face new challenges. They don't quite know what to do. But they have not made the fundamental recognition that says that you cannot build a viable policy that's built around power and in inequality, that's built around we have power and we're going to tell you what you can do and not do that's built around the idea that it's your oil and we're going to control it, that's built around the idea that you're con conducting an illegal occupation and building illegal settlements, and we're going to stand back and let you do it and fund it to the tune of $3 billion a year and absolute protection in the United Nations. You know, we heard a lot last year about President Obama was too hard on Israel, that he was too critical uh, of Israel, that he was putting too much pressure on Israel. I didn't hear any pressure. I heard a request, please stop building settlements. Answer, no. Please stop building settlements. No. Pretty please stop building settlements. No. Look, please stop building just some settlements for just a little while. Maybe. No. And then they stopped asking. That's not pressure. Pressure starts like this. Please stop building settlements. They're illegal. No. Answer, okay, you can do what you want. But you know that $3 billion a year that you've been getting? You can kiss that goodbye. And you know how we've protected you in the United Nations so that your potential war crimes are never investigated and no one is ever held accountable? We're not doing that anymore. That's what pressure looks like. That's the beginning. That's step one. 
of pressure. That doesn't even get to sanctions. That just gets to, we're going to stop enabling the human rights violations. We never heard that. We never heard pressure. So we have a very big job to do, to transform how our government operates. Public opinion in this country has changed dramatically. It's changed on the question of Israel and Palestine. It's changed on the nature of how we see the Arab world, how we see Arabs. It's an amazing thing, you know, the, the shift, what, one of the things that the Arab Spring did was transform how most Americans, who most people don't know any Arabs, how people understood who's an Arab, what does an Arab look like, how do they talk, how do they act, what are their countries like. All of a sudden, here's a bunch of people on TV who, what a surprise, look just like us. And the guys on TV even speak English. They had their cell phones, they're wearing jeans. Wait a minute, I mean it challenged the notions, the stereotypes, the racism and the Islamophobia that has shaped how people in this country see the Arab world. But our government hasn't caught up. So government policy is still based on uncritical support for Israel, the same $30 billion a year. The wars in Iraq and Afghanistan are slightly smaller than they were, but they are not even close to winding down. The war in, Af in Iraq, which by, by treaty, has to be ended by the end of this year. The U.S. signed off all U.S. troops, all Pentagon-paid contractors have to be out of Iraq by December 31st of this year. But what are we hearing instead? The U.S. is desperately trying to get the corrupt Iraqi government to, quote, invite us to stay just a little bit longer. And in the meantime, they're desperately working to transform those thousands of Pentagon paid contractors into State Department paid contractors because contractors paid by the State Department weren't included in the Status of Forces Agreement. Why, God knows, probably somebody forgot and just put in the language saying all troops, all military contractors and forgot that, you know, these guys in the Pentagon are smart enough to say, oh, well, they said military contractors. They didn't say anything about State Department contractors. So it's going to be the same contractors with the same weapons carrying out potentially the same war crimes, but their check will be written by the, Pentagon, by the State Department instead of the Pentagon. Great. And as a matter of fact, at the moment, there are still 43,000 U.S. troops occupying Iraq and about 70,000 Pentagon-paid contractors. Afghanistan, we've been hearing about there's going to be a drawdown, okay, but at the moment, we still have 98,000 U.S. troops occupying Afghanistan, 45,000 NATO troops occupying Afghanistan, and 120,000 U.S. paid military contractors occupying Afghanistan. Now what we heard was, we're going to withdraw troops from the 30,000 troop, the 30,000 strong surge that President Obama ordered. Well, what's wrong with this picture? Number one, that surge wasn't 30, it was 33,000, thank you very much. Number two, that was the second surge. Because remember, just three weeks after President Obama swore his oath of office, he ordered 21,000 more troops to Afghanistan and said, we're going to send the troops and then we'll figure out the strategy. How smart is that for somebody who's supposed to be a pretty smart guy? So we heard that 10,000 were going to be withdrawn by the end of this year. Okay, that's good. The more out, the better. And 20,000, 23,000 next year, fine. And then what? And then what? We're left with 65,000 troops ad infinitum. No end in sight. Well, by 2014, we will transfer authority to the Afghan military and Afghan police. Okay. Transfer authority, that sounds very nice. But nowhere do I hear we're going to withdraw all the rest of the troops by them because they have no intention of withdrawing those troops. We have a huge challenge. The Arab Spring runs up against the U.S. military everywhere they turn. And that becomes our job, to transform our foreign policy into something based on international law and human rights and equality for all.
away from a policy that's based on supporting occupation, supporting inequality, supporting dictators. That's the goal. So when we ask the question, what can we do to help the Arab Spring? The answer is to create an American autumn to allow the Arab Spring to reach full fruition and to allow us to reclaim our own democracy. Thank you. I guess we have time for questions. And, oh, we have a mic set up. So if folks with questions maybe want to go to the mic so everybody can hear and we'll be able to have a conversation. Here we go. You've spoken a lot about the uh, beginnings of the Arab Spring. The question that I have is about the apparent uh, power vacuum in Egypt right now, and in particular between the Salafis and the Muslim Brotherhood and the secularists, what chance is there for safety for the 10% that is Coptic Christian? Yeah, the situation in, in uh, Egypt right now is very grim. Uh, I think the biggest problem is still the military. They have been very uncertain about their willingness to give up power. They've been uneven in their willingness to protect the civilian population. Most recently, they've been unwilling to protect the Copts, but they've also been reluctant and refused to protect Muslim protesters. They've held on, excuse me, they've held on to power, uh, and as we saw just three days ago, they have used that power brutally, uh, using armored cars and armored personnel carriers to run over protesters. 27 people killed, hundreds injured, and the government calling, the government uh, television station calling for people to come into the streets to protect the military from the attacks of who? Of some kids with stones against armored personnel carriers? This was insane. So there's a very serious challenge afoot. I think the sectarian, my Egyptian friends, both Copts and, and Muslims, tell me that the uh, there, there is a strand of sectarianism in Egyptian politics, no question, but it's been vastly overstated uh, and taken advantage of by the military in particular. I think that if the military moved more quickly, and they are under pressure to do so and may feel the compulsion to do so, they've, they've been in a somewhat different position now, having to answer to uh, civilian opinion in a way that they never did before. Uh, I think that there is every likelihood that the possibility of uh, sectarianism being diminished can happen. I don't think, I, I don't want to be a Pollyanna. I'm not going to say it's going to go away. There is a Salafi, the, the Salafism is the, the sort of hardcore extremist version of Islamism. It exists in Egypt, it exists throughout the region. It's quite small. I think it's visible now in a way it's never been visible because it was completely suppressed under Mubarak. And now it's kind of out there showing its face and it's rather frightening for people for all the understandable reasons. But I don't see any evidence that it's actually a significant, significantly large political force. I think the issue is more the question of what kind of public pressure can be brought to bear on the military to force that, uh, that transfer of power to be sooner rather than later. And that will set the stage for that very long struggle for reclaiming civil uh, civil discourse and, and civil rights inside Egypt. It's not going to be an easy one. Uh, you mentioned the negative effect that NATO forces and American forces had uh, in using air force in uh, Libya. Mm -hmm. I was wondering uh, if you thought the effect would have been the same if Libyans would have been able to gain their own independence without the use of the air force and if the Egypt situation declines, if uh, the whole Arab Spring movement overall would be negatively influenced? Yeah, it's, it's a very good question. Obviously, none of us know. My own sense is that there was the possibility that the Libyans had the capacity to win their own revolution. There's no guarantees. I think there was a danger that there could have been a massacre in Benghazi. Uh, 
but I think it, there was no evidence that it was either imminent or inevitable. It was certainly a possibility. I'm certainly not going to say there was no threat. How could they have taken up arms? People believed they were at risk. The reason I say I think they could have, that there's evidence they could have won themselves, was that at the beginning they did. Before the first French airstrikes, the first French air, airstrikes, if you recall, were against four of Gaddafi's tanks that were in the desert. They had been abandoned outside of Benghazi. They had been driven out into the desert. But the key to me was they had been forced out. They had come to attack the city. They had been driven out by people in Benghazi, including military people who had defected in large numbers with their weapons, etc. It was all true that in the east, like Benghazi, they had not had access to the same level of weapons, the same kind of training as in Gaddafi's strongholds, but they had had training. They did have weapons. There were military bases, and they had managed to drive these tanks out of their city so that when the first airstrikes hit, they hit outside. They didn't hit. The tanks were not still in the city. That, to me, said there was some military capacity there to fight back. And I, I wasn't there. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to, to judge that they're bad for making the decisions they did, but there are consequences. That's, that's the, the end game. I mean, you make certain choices based on what you think are the, is the best way of protecting your family, protecting your country, fighting for democracy. And when you make certain choices, consequences ensue that can make things worse. And I'm afraid that's what happened in Libya. Other questions? Somebody's cell phone, is that a question? Thank you for your telling us tonight about what's going on. I had some experiences myself. Uh, I'm the 1995 Iowa Teacher of the Year and the historian and co-chair for international relations of the National State Teachers of the Year. And I've hosted students from 16 different countries over the years and the university asked me to go to the airport to greet international students the last two years. Last summer, I met two veterinarians from Egypt. They spoke English, so I taught them how to count to several thousand in Chinese in less than five minutes so they could read Russian, and they weren't expecting that. And then I gave them a couple of cards that I have in how I see people, and I've done this all over the world. I will ask every kid, do you know what I see when I see you? And I get utter stunned silence. So I tell them, I see the most precious thing on the planet Earth. That's the way you should see yourself, because if you do, you won't do anything dumb or stupid to harm anything yourself. See all the people around you, they also see the same thing. I handed it out to two, these two veterinarians from Egypt. When they got done reading it, they said, we've never had anybody in our country tell us anything like that before in our lives. And then I met uh, two a father and a son who were starting school here, the son was, from the Sudan. And I taught them some math, and then I asked them, and they said they spoke Arabic. So I handed my card to them in Arabic. They read it in Arabic, and they also said, we've never had anybody tell us anything like that in our lives. And then about three days later, I met two kids from Lebanon who spoke English, French, and Arabic. I gave them the card, and they also said, We've never had anybody tell us anything like that before in our lives. And I'm wondering if people are never told their true value, it makes it very easy for the leaders of the world to abuse them, I think. Now, is there some of that going on? Well, I think that that's a big problem everywhere, including here. I think most people in this country, particularly in poor communities, never hear anyone tell them of their value. So I think that is a problem in many places when people grow up through generations of disempowerment, dispossession, living under military occupation, living under military dictatorship, living under apartheid systems. Uh, you, you grow up unable to pass on to your children a sense of value because you've never experienced being valued by anyone else. It becomes a sequential thing. So I think you're right. I think it's, it's a huge problem all around the world. I wouldn't uh, say that it's only, only a, a problem in, in the Arab world. I think it's just as much a problem here. It's a problem here because I attended a mental health conference at Sheman yesterday, and the, the people that were dealing with mental health were talking about the same thing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. In this country. Thank you. Thank you very much. Other questions?
couple more, then you're all going to go and buy books, right? They're cheap, they're little, they fit in your pocket. Thank you very much for your talk. I'm wondering, for a resource that is as valuable as oil, that is, I mean, I, none of us are very happy that our world depends on oil, but it, it does, um, and that's not going to change anytime soon. What hope is there for anyone really managing it in a not corrupt way, um, either in their own country or abroad? Not much. <laughs> I mean, you raise exactly a, a crucial question. I'm a little more hopeful that the um, drastic impact that we're already facing of, of global warming and climate change is forcing a reconsideration of oil dependency that is going to lead to changes being sooner than they might have been otherwise in a less dramatic situation. But I think you're right, it's not going to happen imminently. Um, there's no, I don't think there's any recipe. The one country that's different where the, the presence of oil has not resulted in the impoverishment of the population, the dispossession of the population, the vast disparity between wealth and poverty of the population is Norway. It's the one model where the wealth of the oil fields uh, is sent by check to every family. Every person in Norway gets a personal share of the oil every year along with a, a huge role for government. The private sector has very little role. The government provides cradle-to-grave uh, education, housing assistance, health care, all the things that in a wealthy country should be taken for granted. Norway is probably the only country where people actually get access to all that. Um, on the other hand, it's a very wealthy country it's an educated country, and it's a country with a tiny population relative to the amount of uh, oil that it has, so it's probably not a very transferable um, model. I don't think there are good models. I think that the problem of resource wars is going to get worse because we're not only talking about wars over oil, we're also talking about natural gas. Very soon we're going to be talking about water. I think the next set of wars is going to be fought over water which is becoming an increasingly scarce resource. Um, and I think that how that plays out in terms of which countries become powerful because they have water versus which countries don't is going to really transform power relations throughout the world. That's it? Good. There'll be time. There'll be time for more questions and a um, book signing back in the corner over there. And you can buy your book right over at the door. And so if you all join me again in thanking Phyllis Bennis.